feet this evening, Jacques Paul, the President's Keepers. Now, from its opening pages of his furtive trip to an icy postmodern Moscow, Jacques Paul's the President's Keepers keeps you hooked. Like a John le Carre spy thriller, you can hardly put it down for fear of interrupting the next exciting revelation. <laughs> and like an espionage escapade, there are actually lots of espionage in Jacques' book, you have your assemblage of villains and good guys in abundance. In Paul's account of our Jacob Zuma and a tightly knit group of loyalists, have managed to capture our law enforcement agencies, plunder our state resources, and erode our most important institutions of governing. It's a tale of a veritable rogues gallery, parasitically eating away at the foundations of our democracy, until now, almost with impunity, and destroying the dream promised in our founding constitution that we would be a country of freedom and equality. There are, of course, the inevitable spooks, the dime a dozen corrupt politicians, and, of course, South Africa's first family. No, not the Zumas. <laughs> but unlike Le Carre, this, unfortunately, is not fiction. Even if Zuma's backers would want the country to believe that, it's the cold heart reality that our country has been living through for the past decade or more. It's the nightmare every country fears of a revolutionary change degenerating into corruption and <clears throat> malfeasance. One is not sure what is worse, the mendacious cover-up which the ruling party has made possible by its stubborn refusal to hold Zuma to account, or the deep-seated long-term damage that Zuma's soiled legacy will leave. Both, I suppose, are probably equally worse. Now, periods in a country's history are often summed up and marked by books which capture very pivotal moments. Who can forget Eddie LaRue's Time Longer Than Rope, which inspired so many to believe in the hope of freedom? Or Saul Plyke's Moody, which captured in searing human poignancy the devastation um, as a result of land dispossession of the indigenous people, and actually helped to give shape to the African National Congress? Or Alan Payton's cried the beloved country that revealed to the whole world the human tragedy that was being perpetrated on black people by the pernicious apartheid system. We all know Jacques for his work as an investigative journalist, ex exposing the death squads of the apartheid state, and for his later work on chronicle in South Africa's remarkable post-apartheid journey of accounting for the atrocities and human rights violations through the Truth and Reconciliation Commission process. Now Jacques, modest as I know he is, may not want to claim the same mantle for his rendition of what could just as easily have been titled Weep the Pillaged Country. Who knows what place this book will have in our country's evolving history. But we do know that it is a very important book. Also because the masses are reading it, which makes it such a powerful tool in exposing Zuma's criminal syndicate. And for this reason alone, we owe Jacques a deep debt of gratitude. We are glad, Jacques, that you left your kitchen at your guest house in Ribeck Castile to cook up this feast of Malfians and sordid pillaging. But we hope that you may soon be able to return to your more normal culinary pursuits, where you will be able to enjoy the finer things in life Without, without having to trawl through the detritus of rapacious greed. <laughs> Welcome, Jacques. Good evening. Um, when I talk to people, and I've spoken to many, 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 there's always two questions they ask me, and I think I'm going to get them out of the way. <laughs> the first one is, are you going to prison? <laughs> and the second one is, aren't you scared? Well, 
First of all, I'm not going to prison. Um, this is not the apartheid state. We live in a modern, a modern democracy, and we ruled by a constitution. When we started Frey Wehrplatt in the, in the 80s, Max de Preer, myself, and some other journalists, we worked under a state of emergency where the government could ban newspapers, they could imprison people for, an, for 90 days and then another, hundred, uh, then another 90 days for 180 days. Um, they could force journalists to reveal their sources and some journalists in fact went to prison for refusing to do that. We don't live under such a regime anymore. Doesn't mean they don't want to do it. Of course they want to do it. That's why we got a letter from the State Security Agency that they, they want to remove the book from the shelves. Now, can you imagine? And this is the level of intelligence we're talking about, and we're going to expand on it a bit later. Can you imagine that there's people sitting at the Musanda headquarters of State Security, and they think they can remove a book from the shelf? This is not the apartheid state. They can't do it. And thanks to them, we sold 130,000 books. <laughs> um, I've got a brilliant legal team. There's, there's two police investigations against me. Um, in both cases, I'm investigated by the, um, by the organized crime unit of the Hawks. Now, instead of investigating the Guptas and Trillium and Jacob and Dudazani and all these people, the organized crime unit is investigating me, which is, of course, ridiculous. But fortunately, they are so useless <laughs> and they are so bad that I can tell you now that nothing will come of this. Absolutely nothing will come of, come of this. SARS has launched a civil case. SARS has also instituted criminal charges against me for revealing um, confidential taxpayers' information. And then Tom Oyani, um, a Zuma crony, came and he launched an application against me in the Western Cape High Court. Now, when the, when the sheriff of the court, now I don't know whether it was the sheriff from Cape Town or the sheriff from Marmesbury or where he came from, but when the sheriff of the court delivered the summons to me on a Friday morning in Rebecca Steele, one of my staff members wanted to take the, the summons and he said, no, 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 he wants to see me. And when he gave it to me, he said to me, good luck, my friend. <laughs> it's a most ridiculous application for the first time ever. Um, SARS wants um, an order from the, web, from the High Court that a journalist has, has contravened the provisions of the Tax Administration Act. Really, what do, what do they want to do with it? If Tom Oyani gets his order, what's he going to do with it? He's already instituted criminal charges against me, so it's ridiculous. But what it does, and it was very interesting, when SARS launched th this application, they didn't launch the application against the publishers because the publishers were the one that published the information. They were the ones that distributed the information. They're going after me because they think they can legally exhaust me. Because remember, the state has got endless resources. And that's why we've started, not me, why the uh, Media Monitoring Africa has started a fund. We also had, you know, they tried to lock me up in, uh, in sort of the middle of December. The KwaZulu-Natal police um, try, uh, got a warrant for my arrest from a tame magistrate who's in the pocket of Roy Moodley, who's Jacob's friend and paid him the, the salaries. Anyway, in that, in that instance, um, we also had to appoint a top legal team in, in KwaZulu-Natal, but in that case, the police in the end had to launch an application themselves to cancel the warrant. And the colonel who tried to arrest me is now under investigation, and IPAD is investigating him, so we, we have to see what's going to happen there. So I'm not going to jail, <laughs> not going to prison. The second one, are you scared? And you know, journalists don't like that question. 
Um, for the first week of the book, uh, the book was published on the 28th of October, and for the first week, the publishers gave me bodyguards. And one of them was Jabu, a big rock of a man with a gun. <laughs> anyway, so I was moving around with, with Jabu. And then there was the incident at Exclusives where the electricity went out, which, they, which Exclusives believes to this day was some kind of sabotage. So I had my launch in Pretoria the following night. So when Jabu came to fetch me at the hotel the next morning, he didn't only have a gun, he had a torch as well. <laughs> because he said he's not taking any further chances with it. <laughs> so, so I had Jabu for a week and then I send him home. And I don't have bodyguards. And I'm not scared because I'm protected by millions of South Africans. Millions. That support me, that look after me. And it's becoming more and more difficult for them to do anything. Um, I mean, I've, I've said to you before, it was their stupidity that led to the record sales of the book. Now, when, before we launched this book, because we couldn't do any pre-publicity, um, because we were scared they would try and they would attempt to ban the book. And it's much easier to ban a book before it's being published, because once, it, once it's on the shelves, the horse has bolted. Anyway, so we could do no publicity. And when I sat down with... Um, with Benjamin Trisk, who's the CEO of Exclusive Books. He said to me, don't worry, I'm going to sell 25,000 of this book, which is a lot. And the sales were going quite well the first few days. In fact, they were going very well. And then came that beautiful letter from the State Security Agency. <laughs> now, I can't remember the name of their firm of attorneys. Um, a first-year law student at UCT could have done better. It was full of grammatical errors. There were parts that didn't make sense. But anyway, so they said, you know, we give you, this was on a Thursday morning. The book came out on the Sunday. We got the letter on the Thursday. They said, we give you four days to remove the book, failing which we will bring an urgent court application. Now, I'm no lawyer. But when I looked at this letter, I thought, how urgent can it be if they give you four days? <laughs> anyway, so that we told them to, to F off, go, go away. Then suddenly, now, the, 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 the book editor, the man who had to fix my grammatical errors and my skiver tal and whatever, um, he received, Russell Martin is his name, he's a retired gentleman. Russell is about 70 years old. Russell received a letter from state security on the, we, the next Wednesday morning, because we now told them to go away. So they sent a letter to Russell Martin. They said to Russell, we give you two days to remove the book, failing which we will bring an urgent application. Now, obviously, some bright spark at state security looked at the book, and he saw they are edited by Russell Martin. And obviously he thought that works like a newspaper. The editor is in charge of everything. So he wrote a letter to Russell Martin <laughs> and severely traumatized the poor man who thought state security was on to him. So this is, this is the quality of people we are dealing with. This is what has happened to our security establishment under the rule of Jacob Zuma. This is what they have become. Toothless, useless, lazy, um, and for all practical purposes, institutions like the Hawks, like crime intelligence, doesn't exist anymore. The only use they have is that they have tremendous secret funds which can be stolen from, and which is, which is being stolen from. And that is the result of the Zuma rule. I'll get back to that as well. So I've answered the two questions. You're not, you're not going to answer, answer me, ask me about my security, and I'm not scared. I mean, I, 
You know, I have a restaurant and a guest house in Rebecca. Still, it stands open. Anybody can walk in there. Anyway, and as I said, it's, it's basically because the book has been in the limelight since it was published. That makes it very difficult for them to act. Um, the problem also they have when they threaten a journalist is that more people come forward with information. Now, since the publication of the book, I had lots of people who contacted me with information. Now, most of them I haven't seen yet because I don't want to contact them because I know they're listening to my phone and my movements are being monitored and whatever. So I don't want to compromise any future sources. But when I wrote this book, for example, when I wrote the, the three chapters about state security and about the, the corruption around the PAN program that Arthur Fraser ran, there was one report I was looking for and I couldn't get it, and that was the report of the Inspector General of Intelligence, which is a secret report that she did about the PAN program. I had other reports, but I wanted that IGI report, which I couldn't find, but that was fine. I, you know, I thought I might you know, get it in future. But anyway, so during my book, book launch in Pretoria at Exclusives in Brooklyn, and by the way, that was the exclusives in the country that sold the most books. Because SARS is only about 200 meters from the, <laughs> from the Brooklyn exclusives. But anyway, so while I was sitting there signing books, it, and I saw him from the corner of my eye, a gentleman walked past me and he dropped a white bag. <laughs> and I ignored the white bag, and, I, and when I was finished, I picked up the white bag. And what was in the white bag? The reports by the... Inspector General, which I subsequently handed to Danny Maverick, and they've written a series of articles about it, and since then Arthur Fraser has been absolutely quiet. There, there was another incident where somebody called me, also from state security, somebody called me, and he said he wanted to see me. And I said to him, okay, I'll, you know, I've got your telephone number, I will contact you in future. And then I'm very good friends with Glynis Breitenbach, the old NPA prosecutor who's now an MP for the, for the DA. Anyway, this gentleman then called Glynis Breitenbach, and he wanted to give her something. And then Glynis called me, and I decided, no, 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 now I have to do something because I don't know who, who else he's going, to, he's going to call. So... Just before Christmas, Glynis and myself were in Johannesburg, and we decided we're going to see this guy in Pretoria. And he was very cautious, and he said we should meet him at 11 o'clock at night at a petrol station. <laughs> um, so what subsequently happened, I discovered, is he said 11 o'clock because he wanted his wife to be asleep, because he didn't want to do... You know, his wife wasn't agreeing with him about all of this. So he sneaked out at night and he went to the petrol station. Now anyway, Glynis is very, very good friends with Nati Kish, the billionaire. And because shots have been fired at Glynis before when she was still a prosecutor, Nati sort of looks after her when she goes to Pretoria. So that night, Glynis and myself went to Pretoria in Nati's armored X5 BMW. <laughs> it, weigh, it weighs two tons. I mean, the windows are that thick. And with the X5 came two bodyguards. And so it's Glynis and me at the back and the two bodyguards in the front in this armored vehicle, which it basically is, going to Pretoria. And you know how these people drive, these blue light brigade people. Anyway, so as we approach the filling station. We could see the guy standing there waiting for us. It was very deserted. And these guys sort of charged onto, onto him with this black BMW X5. And as he saw the car coming, he thought it's state security that's onto him. And he started putting his hands in the air already. So anyway, so the information is leaking out from, from all over. And this will continue for as long as the state harasses me. Okay, let's start. Um, 
you know, I didn't plan to write another book. Um, and when I left journalism in 2014, I decided this is it. I'm not going to write again. I've had a long career in journalism. I've written five books. It's time to start something new. But it was impossible to ignore what was going on in the country. It was absolutely impossible to ignore. You know, when, when, when Zuma fired Nene and then the allegations started around sort of like state capture and, um, and jobs that were offered by, by the Guptas to people like Fakie Mentor and Jonas and what, I, it was just, you know, it, so I was reading about this day after day after day. And Max de Prier lives in the, the same village as I. And he was saying to me, um, you have to start writing again, which I resisted until I got the call in December last, this December last year, in December 2016, about the documentation about the, the, the fraud and corruption at state security. And I remember this guy who phoned me, said to me, come, 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 you have to, you have to do something about it. And I said to him, I can't, I'm a chef now, I'm not a journalist. <laughs> And he said to me, just give him a call, just speak to him. And I said to him, okay, I'll do that. Where is he? And he said, in Moscow, in Russia. <laughs> so a week later, I was on a plane to Moscow. I couldn't help myself. You know, I said to people afterwards, I'm probably like a rehabilitated heroin addict. <laughs> and this guy gave me a syringe full of heroin, and I couldn't help but you know, injecting it into my veins. Off I went to Russia, and that's how the book started. I came back and I decided, okay, you know, I'm going to do this. I knew we had to publish the book um, before the ANC elective conference in December. Now, I don't know whether you've seen the reports in, you know, newspapers like, you know, the Sunday Independent and ANN7 and whatever, that the book was actually written by Pravin Kordan and... You know, Ivan Pele and people like that. But anyway, so I started writing. It was very difficult to write this book because usually what you want to do is you want to do all your research and then you want to start writing and you want to organize everything. In this case, I had to write as I researched because I only had eight or nine months to write this book, which means I was sometimes writing four or five chapters at the same time and as the information came in and I spoke to people and they gave me stuff I you know I would write a little bit here a little bit there anyway so I did the book in uh, in nine months I wish I had another six months to do more research and get more information when I started the book um, the publisher said to me do you think you can get 90,000 words together and I said I'll try and then I got to 100,000 words, and they said to me, you must stop. <laughs> and then I got to 110,000 words, and they said to me, please stop now. And when I got to 115,000 words, they said to me, that's it. Um, we, are now, we are now going to, to publish this. It was an incredible experience. It was an, an incredible journey to an earth what was happening in our law enforcement agencies. It was an incredible experience to expose this cabal of people standing behind Zuma. Most of my information came from, from people who work in the law enforcement agencies. And you know, the first thing I did when I, when I started doing research, I started speaking to other journalists who used to work with me sort of three or four years before this. And they would give me tips. They would say to me, try and, try and speak to this one and try and speak to that one. And I think it helped a lot that I wasn't a journalist anymore because people don't always trust journalists. You know, they're scared they're going to see their name in the Sunday Times on Sunday or that kind of thing. So it was rather incredible, but people were incredibly scared because these were people who had jobs, they had families, they had some kind of a future, and they knew that they could lose everything if they ever get exposed. 
I had to do kind of like, I had to consult people before, and is how do you do, how do you communicate with people um, when you're scared about your phone being listened to or that kind of thing? So there was sort of a whole series of steps we had to do, and we used Telegram, and we used sort of secret messages and whatever. Anyway, so this happened over, over a period of time. Now, you know, a lot of my book is about SARS, the SA Revenue Service. Now, just to give you some background, is when I left journalism in 2014, and I left in the end of September of 2014, the cracks were showing in SARS. Um, I don't know whether you remember the scandal about the SARS rogue unit that involved people, people like Ivan Pillay and Johan van Lochenberg and Jean Ravelli and people like that. That scandal started. And even before I left journalism, I mean, one of the last stories I wrote was about the fact that state security was involved in the demise of SARS, that there was a plot, that it was orchestrated, and nobody believed it. And then I left journalism, and eventually it emerged that that was, in fact, the case. SARS was the jewel in the crown of the civil service. This was the state institution that enabled the state to pay 17 million grants, social, social welfare grants. This was an institution that not just met its targets every year, it exceeded its targets. It was brilliant. Um, the architect of the modern SARS was Pr uh, Pravin Gordon. Before him, um, it was Manuel. Um, it was a world-class institution. It was studied at international business schools, its, its models and its, its programs. Um, and then, came the demise of SARS, and it happened very quickly when Tom Oyani, Uzuzuma Crony, they were in the ANC together, they were in Mozambique together. Moyani um, looked after Zuma's children when, when, they, when they grew up. He's described one of Zuma's um, wives as his sister. Um, when he was appointed at SARS in October 2014, the demise started very, very quickly. And within a few months, he got rid of the whole top executive of SARS. He got rid of Ivan Pillay, Johan van Lochrenberg, Jean Ravelli, Piet Richer, all those people. He got, he got rid of. And in their place, he appointed his own cronies. Now, Tom Moyani knows nothing about tax. Nothing, absolutely nothing. His highest job in government was that of prison's boss. Before that, he was the print, printer boss. The, he was the head of the state printer. Then he was the head of prisons. And then he became the commissioner of SARS. A man who knows absolutely nothing about tax. And since he has been appointed, um, his only goal has been the protection of Zuma and his cronies, and I'm going to illustrate it to you. What happened is, in 2010, and I mean, I, this is all in my book. In 2010, now Zuma has always, be, always been a terrible taxpayer. Before he became president in May 2009, um, he was already found guilty of, of tax evasion and he, uh, he paid a fine and whatever. He's got a te terrible, terrible, terrible record as far as his taxes are concerned because his finances are in such a mess, because he's a kept man. He was, before he became president, he was kept by Shabir Sheikh. Nelson Mandela gave him a million rand. Vivian Reddy gave him lots of money. There were, there were other money he received from the arms deal. He's got, his finances are in a terrible state. But before he became president in May 2009, SARS finally got his tax affairs in order. Then he became president. And very soon, SARS discovered that he was not submitting his tax returns. Now, what can be more simple than for a president to submit his tax returns? He gets his presidential salary. He has no other income. It's a very, very simple process. 
And that was when they discovered that he got payments from Roy Moodley, who's a security tycoon in uh, KwaZulu Natal. A man over the years who got lots of very, very shady contracts, state contracts. Um, he's been a friend of Zuma for very, very long. When he turned 60, in, or 50, I think it's when he turned 50, in, two th in 2013, Zuma was the guest of honor at his birthday party at the International Convention Center in Durban. And Moodley's son made a speech that night, and Zuma was sitting next to Roy Moodley. And Moodley's son said, my father is the most powerful man in the country. And nobody blinked, because they all know. But anyway, so SARS, SARS discovered the fact that Zuma had gotten payments from Roy Moodley while he was president, for four months into his presidency. For a year before, four months into his presidency. And that was the reason why Zuma couldn't submit his tax returns. Because remember, if, when your tax return is like, is like an affidavit. It's set in stones. What you declare in your tax return, that's it. Can't change your mind afterwards. And you also, of course, had, pro had problems a year or two later with Nkandla up upgrades. Because legislation is very clear. If you benefit from upgrades, you have to pay tax on it. Um, and SARS calculated that he owes 63 million rand in upgrade tax, which, which Zuma, of course, couldn't pay either. And that's why he didn't submit his tax returns. And then I discovered these documents about a meeting between Ivan Pillay and Jacob Zuma, and the date is very important, a meeting that took place in February 2014, where Ivan Pillay, who's a most, most credible man, where Ivan Pillay said to Zuma, Mr. President, you have to submit your tax returns. And if you don't submit your tax returns, we are going to treat you like an ordinary taxpayer. And at that moment in 2014, and it's very clear in the documentation, at that moment in 2014, Zuma was confronted by the reality that if SARS order an audit against him, he could be sequestrated. And an unrehabilitated unre insolvent cannot be the president of the country. The only solution is that the top structure of SARS had to be removed. And that is why Moyani was brought in. That is why state security embarked on a campaign against Van Lochrenberg, who headed all the investigative units of SARS. That's why they had to get rid of Ivan Pillay and of people that worked on these cases. And of course, at that time in 2014, SARS also started an investigation against the Guptas. Um, Edward Zuma was under investigation. Kulabusi Zuma was under investigation. Lots of Zuma cronies like Tosh and Pande, people like that, their names go on forever, were all under investigation by, by SARS. The tobacco smugglers, and the, the, the tobacco smuggling is a, plays a fascinating role in the, in, the whole, in the whole saga of SARS. In that these tobacco smugglers, Kaji, Mazati, Amot Karam, all these people, um, now you know that a packet of cigarettes costs no more than two or three rand to manufacture. But then there is like 20 rand of tax on that packet of cigarettes, sin tax. So if you can avoid paying taxes, you make a fortune um, in, with, with, with cigarettes. In fact, cigarettes has become the new gold. It's as profitable as drugs, but it doesn't carry the same penalty. So what all these tobacco smugglers were trying to do was to get... Um, politically connected people on their, on their boards of directors, for example. Kaji got Edward Zuma. Mazati befriended Julius Malema. And so you can go on and on and on about the, politi the political 
um, people that played a political role in the affairs of the taxpayer. So there were lots of investigations going on um, into the, the affairs of these, these tobacco smugglers. It all happened sort of in 2013, 2014. As a result, and this is how clever Zuma is, one would think, how can, a, how can the president just remove the top structure of an institution like SARS? And he did. And he did it very effectively. The first thing they did is the state security agency launched a campaign against Johan van Lochrenberg, who was then introduced to this blonde lawyer, blonde, blonde Pretoria lawyer, Belinda Walter, who turned out to be a state security spy. He was gone. Pillay then followed. Jean Ravelli followed. Piet Richer followed. Um, the top structure, by, by the beginning of 2015, the top structure of SARS were gone. What has happened is that Moyani has completely, and then came the Sunday, and then, of course, I mean, you know, there's, there's so much around this, but the, the Sunday Times was used to carry the narrative of the SARS rogue unit. The fact that certain units in SARS had gone rogue, that they had spied on Jacob Zuma, and they had a brothel, and whatever. And the, and the Sunday Times was very, very complicit in the demise of SARS. They were very complicit in state capture, in fact. And if there's ever, ever a, a wall of shame for journalists, Sunday Times editor Felicia Oppelt would be right at the top for publishing this absolute nonsense week after week after week. The Sunday Times has, in the meantime, has withdrawn all the stories. They apologized. They admitted that it was wrong. Um, KPMG has withdrawn their report that Moyani used to get rid of all these executives, but it's too late. There's very little left of SARS. When Van Lochrenberg left in 2014, he was the first one to leave in August 2014, he was suspended. When he left, now these investigative units of SARS, there were five of them, they were the people that enabled SARS to extract taxes from people like Glenn Agliotti and Radu Van Kretscher and the Jacksons and the gangsters and people like that. Um, and when he, when he left in 2014 for Lochrenberg, they had presented three gangsters with their tax bills. The first one was Robert Wang. He was a Chinese immigrant. He came to the country in 1992 um, from Taiwan. He committed murder in 1994 was sentenced to 12 years imprisonment. Somehow he managed in serving only four years. Came out um, and he started a company called Mpasi Trading and he appointed Kulabusi Zuma to, as the chairperson of his board. He then uh, accompanied Jacob Zuma to business trips to China and in 2014 he imported t-shirts for the ANC for the election and whatever. He's an importer-exporter. All he does is he washes money, he sends money out of the country. He's a money launderer. Um, SARS presented him with a tax bill in 2014 of one billion rand. That tax bill would by now have been like three million with penalties and interest and whatever. And this was after a two-year investigation where they um, where Price Waterhouse Coopers, for example, was the auditors that did the investigation. They went through a whole tax inquiry, which is basically a high court hearing, presented one with a one billion rand tax bill. Mark Liffman, you've all recently read about Mark Liffman, the Cape Land gangster. He got a tax bill of 288 million rand, also close to the Zumas. Um, when, when Jacob came, when Zuma, Jacob Zuma comes to Cape Town, he gets a VIP ticket and he sits on the stage and whatever. And he got a 288 million rand tax bill. And then Adri Adriano Mazzotti, the very famous cigarette smuggler, in fact, 
When Saz investigated Mazzotti, he, he went to Saz and he said to Saz, please, I want to make a deal with you. And Saz said to him, okay, sit down there and give us an affidavit. And in this affidavit, which I have a copy of, and I mention it in my book, in his affidavit, which was made on the 6th of May 2014, he admits that he's a smuggler, he's a money launderer, he tried to bribe Johan van Lochtenberg and Ivan Pillay with 800,000 rand. Um, is a tax evader. He admits everything in his affidavit. He got a tax bill of 600 million rand. So if you take those, that, that, that amount, I mean, you're talking about sort of two, three billion rand in taxes. That was ready to collect, ready for SARS to collect. But then Van Lochrenberg went, Pelay went, and SARS pushed this rogue unit narrative. All three of them came back to SARS and they said to Mujani, you said in your own words, we were investigated by a rogue unit. We're not going to pay our tax bill because it was a rogue unit. It was illegitimate. It was illegal. They did illegal things. They still haven't settled these tax bills and it will never be settled. Now, Moyani has declared a shortfall last year 30 billion rand, and this year it's 50 billion rand. Now, if they had just settled, and there's many other tax bills, many others, the Gupta investigation was stopped. The investigation into British American tobacco was stopped. Everything was stopped. Um, 56 managers at SARS left shortly after the appointment of Moyani. As I said last year, they had a shortfall of 30 billion. This year, it's 50 billion. Where's that money going to come from? It's going to come from me and you. They will have to find it somewhere. There's no money left. Now, Moyani has got a long thing about the bad economic conditions and whatever which might have contributed to some percentage of the 50 million. But there's very little expertise left in SARS. People have left in droves. That's the result of Zuma meddling in the law enforcement agencies. You take the Hawks. When Zuma became president in May 2009, the Hawks, was st well, he then closed down the Scorpions. And you remember the Scorpions. They prosecuted Jackie Celebi and they were going after Zuma and whatever. And as a result, Zuma closed them. Then started the Hawks. And in May 2009, they appointed Anwar Dramat as a Lieutenant General and the head of the Hawks, a terribly credible man. But already then, the signs were very ominous about what was going on in the police, especially when Zuma appointed one Lieutenant General Richard Medluli as the head of crime intelligence. Long before, before um, Medluli was appointed as the national head of crime intelligence, he was the head of crime intelligence in Gauteng. And letters have emerged about, about his, his period there where he wrote letters to Zuma and where he said to Zuma, I'm looking after you and that kind of thing. A Zuma crony, there's no question about it. So he appointed Richard Medluli as the head of crime intelligence and at that point I had a secret fund of about 500 million rands. And of course that fund was looted, it was looted. And, then, and now there was very little crime intelligence investigations going on, the fund was looted. Anwar Ramat appointed Shadrach Sabia, who was the head of the Hawks in Gauteng, to investigate Medluli. And Shadrach Sabia, very credible man, in turn appointed Colonels Kurvis Rulofsa and Piet Fuljun of the Hawks in Cape Town to investigate Medluli. Medluli was then, and during the investigation into, into the, the, the raping of the, of the secret fund, they also discovered that there's an old murder case against Medluli. And as a result, in 2011, Medluli was charged with murder, kidnapping, fraud, corruption, you name it. It was all on the charge sheet. 
As a result, Midluli was suspended. Midluli is still on suspension. He's been on suspension for seven years. He gets his full salary every month. In fact, two years ago, he got a bonus of 400,000 rand for sitting at home. This morning, Fakilim Balula, who's the, the minister of police, and the less said about Fakilim Balula, the better. But anyway, this morning, Fakile announced that, um, that Richard Midluli is leaving the police. What Fakile didn't tell you is that Midluli is retiring. He becomes 16 March. He's leaving the police anyway because he's reached retirement age. He gets his full pension. He gets all his benefits. He's been on suspension for seven years, and for seven years, crime intelligence has been a mess. You read this week about the, uh, the arrest of Colonel KGB, of Captain Maurice Shabalala, who's a heister, spent time in prison for, um, for armed robbery, um, served his sentence, came out of prison, was appointed then by the acting police commissioner, Pashlani, again, despite his criminality and his criminal record, was appointed again at crime intelligence, um, was then in March last year, he was positively identified as being um, a mastermind between a heist at Oliver Tambo International Airport in Johannesburg. The police did nothing about him. He's now been arrested by IPIT, the independent police investigative directorate. And Captain KGB has very much become a, um, a symbol of what is happening at crime intelligence. There's, for example, I mean, there is so many stories around this. There's, for example, there's a man at crime intelligence by the name of Feroz Khan. He was a right-hand man of Midluli. He was promoted from sergeant to colonel in a week. Um, and he also looted the, the secret fund. He was complicit in that. In fact, he drives a Maserati. And he's got a second-hand car dealership. Those cars come from the crime intelligence carpool that he's selling at his dealership. In fact, sort of like in August, September, August last year, Feroz Khan was appointed as a general he became the head of surveillance of the police. When Pete Falloon, we investigated him, when Pete Falloon saw that, he said he's leaving the police and he's asked for early pension. He's only about 53, Pete Falloon. And so the Hawks, like SARS, has also been disemboweled. People have left. There's no expertise left. When is the last time you've heard about an organized criminal getting arrested. It doesn't happen anymore. In fact, at the, at the end of 2016, when Popo Mulefe was appointed as the chairperson of Prasa, now we all know what happened at Prasa, hey? I mean, it's like ESCOM and SAA and all those, you know, state-owned enterprises. It was looted. Um, when Popo Mulefe was appointed as the chairperson of Prasa, he appointed Price Waterhouse Coopers to do a forensic investigation. They found that only 14 out of 260 contracts were above board. They unearthed 14 billion rand of corruption, Price Waterhouse Coopers. And then Popo Mulefe gave these dockets, these files, to the Hawks. And he said to the Hawks, I know you have manpower difficulties. I will even give you the auditors of Price Waterhouse Coopers. I'll pay for them. They can work with you. That was at the end of 2016. At the beginning of last year, Popo Mulefe went to the High Court to try and compel the Hawks to do something. They've done nothing. The Hawks, for all practical purposes, do not exist. If you take state security, for example, and we know nothing about state security, nothing, 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 you are not allowed to know how many people work at, at state security. 
You're not allowed to know how many people work for state security. I can tell you how many, but then you become complicit in a crime. But anyway, the operations budget of, the st of state security is not audited by the Auditor General. He doesn't have access to it. The Auditor General also doesn't have access to the Crime Intelligence Secret Fund. So nobody knows what happens to the money, the, the operations, operational money at state security. There's no threat against the country. There's no external threat. Yet there's a few thousand people working at state security. They have very highly qualified analysts. We know they played a role in the, in the demise of SARS. We know that Arthur Fraser, who was appointed and who was the man... Now, Arthur Fraser oversaw a program. That's the program I write about in my book, The Principal Agent Network, that wasted a billion rand of taxpayers' money. There were only 62 agents in the PAN program. For these 62 agents, they bought 300 cars that were stored in three warehouses around the country. Um, they, for example, they imported surveillance vehicles, very sophisticated surveillance vehicles. I think it was 13 million rand a vehicle that they imported. And when they arrived here, they discovered that they don't know how to work this, how to operate this. So it's been standing, gathering dust at state security headquarters. Um, you know, I can go on and on and on about, state, about the wastage at state security. Nothing ever gets done. Now, very shortly, you will remember that last year, there was a man who was the head of the war, Hawks. I'm jumping around a bit, but I have to tell you this. There was a man who was the head of the Hawks, Lieutenant General Burning Clemeza. He was a bulldozer. He couldn't, he couldn't properly read or write. He was, com he was a complete buffoon, but he was a bulldozer. Drove lots of expertise away from the Hawks, white and black. This is not a white thing. White and black. He drove away from, from the Hawks. Anyway, last year, the, the, the High Court finally ruled that the appointment of Ntlemeza um, was illegal. It was irrational because of the fact that he was previously described in a High Court case that he had lied. And that's how, how um, how civil society got rid of Ntlemeza. The same is going to happen against Arthur Fraser because Arthur Fraser was appointed as the head of the State Security Agency in August 2016. The IGI report that I told you about in the beginning, that secret report that landed next to, my, next to the desk, that report was handed to State Security Minister David Mishlobu in May, May 2016. And despite the report that is a terrible indictment of Arthur Fraser, the minister appointed him as the head of state security. There's going to be similar court applications to get rid of, to get rid of Arthur Fraser. And so I can go on and on and on about the state, about the, the, about the, uh, the security cluster of the state that has been disemboweled by, by Jacob Zuma. Same happened at the NPA. I mean, we all know about, about Sean Abrams. We all know about his predecessor, Jiba, that became a protector of Richard Medluli and was finally disbarred. can go on and on about it. I'm sure you want to know what is lying ahead. That's the big question. Now, I think we first have to... We have to know that... Even if Zuma goes tomorrow, and I think he's going to go very, very, very soon. But even if he goes tomorrow, it's going to take a long, long time to repair the damage that Zuma had done. I know for a fact, for example, that um, Pravin Gordhan has already been approached to become the Minister of Finance again, and he has agreed. 
They want to bring um, Ivan Pillay back as the head of SARS. So they're looking about getting, getting the expertise back. In the case of SARS, it's difficult because many of the people were highly qualified and they now have careers in the private sector somewhere. But they're trying to get expertise back because they believe it's the only way to rebuild these institutions. The same has happened to the NPA where droves of people left the NPA and went into, the, into private practice. You have to get those people back, but it's going to take a long, long time. We suddenly, suddenly heard this week that the asset forfeiture unit wants to, um, wants to seize 50 billion rand of state assets that disappeared under, under state capture. Um, it's all very well, but we must remember that organizations like Trillium, a family like the Guptas, are going to appoint top, top, top lawyers, top legal counsel to oppose these, these forfeiture actions by the state, and it's not going to be easy. It's going to be very, very costly. The damage that Zuma has done is going to take a long time to undo. Now, you know, everybody's speculating at the moment about when Zuma is going. Um, you know, and if you read the newspapers, I mean, you know, there's so many, there's so many analysis of what is going on at the moment. One thing is for sure, and that is that Zuma don't want to go. Um, because he knows that prison is becoming a real option. What is also going to happen, and I think it might be dawning on him, is that his friends, the Guptas, are just going to dump him. They feel nothing for Zuma. The Guptas left in, uh, in December. They got onto their jet and they flew to Zurich. And people tell me they haven't returned. They, no, they haven't come back again. And they might, maybe they will never come back again. Which is going to leave Zuma rather isolated. Now what we also, what we also know is, are there any politicians in this room? <laughs> okay, then I can say it. We all know politicians are prostitutes. <laughs> and those that supported um, Dlamini Zuma is already jumping ship onto the new ship because that's the only way they can ensure a future for themselves. We're seeing that with people like Malusi Gigaba, the Minister of Finance, is already now suddenly making all the right noises and whatever. There's a few people in cabinet, like Mosabenzi Zwani, who's the Minister of Mines, and, and Batibili Dlamini, who's the Minister of Social Welfare, and Des van Rooyen, who's local government. They are, and, and, and um, who's the, who's the minister, um, um, oh, Faith Mutambi, for example. These people are of such low quality that they have no future anywhere else. They might never be employed in their, in their lives again. So they will continue to support Zuma. Um, but we've already seen that people like David Mabuza, who was, who's the, who's the, um, who's the deputy president of the ANC at the moment, the, and the premier of Mpumalanga, is making pro Cyril noises, because he knows that's where his future lies. So I think that Zuma is going to be completely isolated very soon. The thing is, does Cyril want him to go immediately? Because I think he's thinking about the State of the Nation address in February. I don't think Cyril wants to make the State of the Nation address, especially with free education at the moment. <laughs> and maybe he's going to leave it for Zuma to be finally humiliated. Can you imagine Zuma must do the State of the Nation address? He doesn't even have the protection of the speaker anymore, because she's also turned towards, towards Cyril. He's going to, to sit there or stand there, and he's going to be completely isolated. So, you know, I spoke to people this week in Pretoria, and one of them said, ah, oh, he thinks Zuma can last another three months. Somebody said another six weeks. So 
I don't think anybody's sure. But the era of Jacob Zuma is over. It's over. Um, Cyril will appoint a new NDPP, the head of the, the NPA. He will appoint very soon. Moyani will go very quickly. Ivan Pillay will go back. Praveen Gordon will go back. And just maybe, just maybe there's a, there's a chance that we will survive the Zuma era. You know, I've always said during, during the time of Zuma, I've always said there's three pillars that stand, against, that stand between us and becoming a gangster state. Now, I think what my books show is that we've moved into the rearm of the gangster state. We, we're almost there. But there's three, three factors that stand between us and a full-scale gangster state. The one is the courts. And we all know that they've done magnificent work. The second is the media, people that, you know, that expose, you know, in Kanla, the Gupta Leaks, all those things. It's been the fourth estate and they've been fantastic. And the third element is civil society. That's you. And if you look at the work that you know, institutions like the Helen Sussman Foundation, Freedom Under Law, all those institutions have done. It's been absolutely, absolutely wonderful. And that's the difference between us and many other countries. And I don't even want to, name, you know, use the name Zimbabwe. And that's the difference between us and other countries, is our constitution that has enabled a free, free press that has enabled civil society to be proactive um, and the courts that are protected by the, by the Constitution. So I think we're actually going to survive this. I think we might be okay. Had Lamini Zuma come to power, I don't know what would have happened. Then I wouldn't have been so sure that I would not go to prison. Because I think it would have been a simple continuation of the, of the Zuma era. I don't think anything would have, would have changed. We can now look forward to change. We are going to have a clever, modern president. Now, I th just think there's one thing we have, to, we have to, to be aware of. And that is that Cyril Ramaphosa is not clean. Cyril Ramaphosa was appointed as the deputy president in May 2014. And for the past three and a half, four years, he's been sitting next to Zuma. He's been attending all those cabinet meetings. He's praised Zuma for his leadership. Um, you know, I'm not even talking about, you know, about Marikana and things like that. But Ramaphosa is, to a certain extent, complicit of where we are today. So I, don't, I think we have to be very, very aware of Cyril. The other thing we have to be aware of is, you know, everybody talks about white monopoly capital. I think there is white monopoly capital, and I think they've played a terrible role in this. You must remember that when the state does business, they do business with the private sector. The state doesn't do business with the state. They do business with the private sector. And if you look at the role of, of organizations that, like KPMG and Trillium and SAP and all these institutions, they have been complicit in state capture. So I think on the one hand we must be wary of our new president but we must always also be wary of the role of the private sector. They are not innocent in all of this. All the wrongdoing wasn't just committed by the state. It was also committed by the private sector. And none of them must get away with it. They should all pay for what they have done. We need justice in this country. Um, for far too long, these people have been able to evade justice because Zuma had disemboweled the, the, uh, the law enforcement agencies and that was stopped. So the battle is not over. The day that Zuma is dumped in Kandla is not the day the war ends. 
and we have to be very, very aware of the future. And we have to check politicians. Don't let them get away with this again. Questions? <laughs>